ברוכים הבאים לטקס הכרזת זוכי פרס דן דוד לשנת 2020. אני פרופסור איתמר רבינוביץ', יושב ראש קרן דן דוד, ולצידי פרופסור אריאל פורט, נשיא אוניברסיטת תל אביב, ויו"ר הוועד המנהל של פרס דן דוד. לפני שנעבור לסדר היום הצפוי שלנו, אני רוצה לנצל את ההזדמנות ולברך את פרופסור יוסי קלפטר, נשיא לשעבר של אוניברסיטת תל אביב. אתה מקבל מחיאות כפיים על זה. יו"ר לשעבר של פרס דן דוד, ומזה יום זוכה טרי בפרס ישראל בתחומו המדעי, כימיה פיזיקלית. ברשותכם אני אעבור לאנגלית. Good evening and welcome to the announcement of the 2020 Dan David Prize Laureates. I am Professor Itamar Abinovich, Chairperson of the Dan David Foundation, and next to me is Professor Ariel Porat, President of Tel Aviv University and Chairperson of the Dan David Prize Board. The Dan David Prize annually awards three prizes of one million US dollars each for outstanding contributions to humanity. Headquartered at Tel Aviv University, the prize was founded in 2002 by the late Dan David, an international businessman and philanthropist. It is uniquely structured to focus on all fields of human endeavor and highlight topics and disciplines that are underappreciated or are of particular relevance today. Each year, three fields are selected under the rubric of the three time dimensions, past, present, and future. This year, the past, present, the past prize focuses on cultural preservation and revival, the present on gender equality, and the future on artificial intelligence. The public was invited to nominate candidates who they believe to be most deserving of the prize. Specialist review committees composed of leaders in their spheres proposed a short list of finalists to the Dan David Prize Board. Following the board's deliberations, we are here today to announce the laureates of the 2020 Dan David Prize. Professor Porat. גם אני אתחיל מחוץ לפרוטוקול לברך את יוסי על הזכייה המרשימה. כבוד גדול לאוניברסיטת תל אביב. The laureates of the past time dimension in the field of cultural preservation and revival are לוני בנץ' דה טרד, for his role as the founding director of the influential and inspiring National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. for taking a direct role in forming the museum's collection, constituting a material history of the African American experience, passing through all the chapters of American history from the decades of the slave trade through Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Movement, and the current day legacy of that history. Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet for her influential scholarship on performance and Jewish studies for her prolific publications which bridge work of the highest academic standard to a wide audience and impact in interpreting the most diverse aspect of Jewish, Jewish culture and experience in the 20th century for her role as a museum curator, and especially her work in creating the core exhibition at the Polish Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. Our laureate's exceptional achievements have a compelling parallelism in very different sectors, namely the preservation of African-American culture on the one hand, and the preservation of Jewish heritage through performance on the other. (מחיאות כפיים) 
the rates of the present time dimension in the field of gender equality are Professor Deborah Dinitz for her ongoing contributions to the field of gender equality and public health for her work in sexual and reproductive health rights, social protection, and reframing the Zika virus in relation to social and racial inequalities, for her scholarship on human rights and gender equality, for continuing her activism and exile from Brazil, and expanding the reach of her work by combining it with storytelling, art, and community mobilization. Professor Gita Sen for her decades-long contribution to the fields of women's rights, public health, poverty, labor markets, and global governance, for combining her academic career with policy advocacy and activism, for her innovative research on disadvantaged populations in low-income rural settings, for her ongoing mentorship of young scholars and advocates, and for supporting public health services to become more effective and equal. Our laureate's influential scholarship and activism has informed and propelled feminist social movements in distant parts of the globe, enhancing the voices of women from the global south in the pursuit of gender equality and justice for all. The laureates for the future time dimension in the field of artificial intelligence are Demi Sasabis for developing systems that learn from experience to be better than human in mastering highly difficult games believed for centuries to be one of the pinnacles of human intelligence and for achieving this and other phenomenal successes by organizing in new ways large teams of researchers at DeepMind, a company that he conceived and co-founded and that represents a leading example of the promise AI holds for humankind. Professor Amnon Shashua. <laughs> for developing methods in computer vision and in particular in systems that assist human drivers and achieve intelligent real-time vision in the process demonstrating how AI technology can make driving safer and save human lives and for demonstrating with his co-founding of Mobileye how to focus research to develop applications that have a positive lasting impact on society and on the economy. Our laureates, who are first scientists and then entrepreneurs, have not only contributed to the launch of the current artificial intelligence revolution, but they and their companies have come to symbolize it. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who uh, spontaneously applauded uh, Amnon Shashua, I'd like to, to add spontaneously that uh, the Dan David Prize is an international prize headquartered at an Israeli university, but we are very happy when on merit uh, an Israeli uh, laureate uh, is selected every, every so often or every so rarely. Thank you. Uh, the laureates will be honored at the festive Dan David Prize Award Ceremony, which will take place on May 17 at Tel Aviv University in the presence of distinguished guests from all over the world. In addition, the laureates will participate in an array of associated events that week, including academic symposia, the Dan David Prize Scholarship Award Ceremony, and the Name Your Hero Youth Essay 
competition. We invite you to join us in these occasions. Now I'd like to invite Professor Daphna Hacker, head of the Women and Gender Studies program in the Faculty of Law at Tel Aviv University, who will speak on the topic, Gender Equality Moving Beyond the Backlash. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be part of this event and so very happy that the Down the Vid Foundation has decided to dedicate the prize in the present category to gender equality and to nominate Professor Gita Sen and Professor Devoir Dennis as the laureates. One might wonder why gender equality is not part of the past category, but rather was chosen to reflect current excellence and accomplishment. We could have celebrated the extraordinary past achievements of the intellectual and activist feminist movement. Indeed, I would argue that the feminist movement is the most important social movement of the 20th century, and that there is hardly anything within our current social, economic, or personal lives that can be understood detached from this, these achievements. Academia is, in fact, one outstanding example. And if you saw the wonderful film on Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I need add little more. From a very recent reality in which women were not allowed to study at Harvard, let alone teach at this prestigious university, female students account for half of Harvard's student body today and a third of its professors. Notwithstanding the feminist movement's past achievements, the Dan David Foundation's decision to choose gender equality as the topic for the present category is extremely timely, important, and even urgent. The feminist revolution is far from being completed. In many parts of the world, women still lack an equal right to education and participation in the paid labor force, have very limited access to basic health services, and suffer from severe physical, sexual, and economic violence in their homes. But the feminist revolution is not completed even for women who live in countries that allegedly grant them basic equal rights. This is so, among other reasons, because while women enter the paid labor force, men have yet to enter the private sphere. In Israel, the statistics teach us that less than 1% of fathers who are entitled to paternity leave execute this right. Moreover, a recent study found that among couples with children, the fathers spend 17 hours more than the mothers in paid work per week on average, while the mothers spend 29 hours more than the fathers on housework and childcare. When the paid work and unpaid work add up, it turns out that mothers work on average 12 hours more than fathers every week. In fact, the paid labor market is still constructed on a masculine model that assumes employees have no family responsibilities making it almost impossible for men to become equal partner, partners at home, even if they wish to. So we have the male public sphere versus the female private sphere, and the impact of this ongoing dichotomy on women's ability to participate in the public sphere on equal footing is devastating. Women are centered in what is called pink color occupations, such as teaching, nursing, and secretarial work, which are on the continuum of what women are already, already doing at home and what are considered female tasks. These occupations are also not rewarding economically since society is not used to paying women for the labor of care they perform, although what could be possibly more important than teaching our children and nursing the ill? When women manage to enter male professions such as law and medicine, they are disproportionately represented on the lower strata with lower pay and fewer mobility options than men. Going back to academia, as an example, in Israel, women represent 58% of BA students, 63% of master's students, and 53% of PhD students. However, they are extremely overrepresented in studies relating to education, social work, and paramedicine, and severely underrepresented in physics, mathematics, engineering, and computer science. Looking at women's representation within the senior academic staff of Israeli universities, we find that women account for only a third. Just 17% of full professors and less than 15% of researchers within physics, mathematics, engineering, and computer science departments are women. Zooming out, women in Israel earn on average 33% less than men, 
one of the biggest wage gaps within developed countries, and only 14% of CEOs are women. The labor force is not the only aspect of Israeli public sphere in which women are marginalized. Women are underrepresented also in politics and culture. In the Knesset, women were never even a third of parliament members. When it comes to popular singers, one of the most depressingly recent surprising statistics is that while 10 years ago, female singers accounted for almost half of those heard on radio, today they account for only 12.5% in radio charts, with not even one uh, woman in the top 10 most popular singers list. All these examples point to the fact that when we talk about gender equality, we must urgently address men. This is so, however, not only because it is a condition for equality for women, but because men are yet to be freed from patriarchy themselves. The, sub the sobering statistics on male violence, longevity, depression, and suicide are important indications that trying to perform according to current hegemonic masculinity scripts is no guarantee for physical and emotional well-being. On the contrary, men have much to gain from the feminist battle against violence, its ethic of care, and its struggle for a generous welfare state and a workforce that offers healthy work-family balance. The labor of care in the private sphere is not only a burden, but also a joy, and a key to a meaningful life and rewarding effective connections with others. Surrendering to an all-demanding paid labor market means, in many cases, extreme stress, alienation, and loneliness. Women and men should join hands in struggling for a labor market that allows us all to be both active participants in the paid labor force and active care providers for those who we love. Regrettably, not only are almost all men detached from this and other feminist struggles, some of them are also very vocal in the current backlash against past feminist achievements. This global, intense, and sometimes successful backlash includes the appalling incel movement of men who slur women online, verbally attack them, and even go on, on to murder them because they believe that feminism is responsible for men's involuntary celibacy and that women must surrender to their sexual desire. Most of this movement's activity takes place online and is an extreme example of the unbelievable depth of misogyny that can be found in the virtual sphere. But the backlash is perpetuated not only by miserable and highly disturbed men who blame women for their misfortune, but also by political leaders in democratic countries. President Trump and his unapologetic chauvinist behavior towards women and anti-feminist attitudes, for example, regarding abortion and LGBT rights, is a prominent example. But he's not alone, as threats made to academic gender studies programs around the world demonstrate. Cynical and dangerous male leaders portray feminists as the enemy of the nation, as part of these leaders' overall attack on substantial democracy. They manage to turn men and women against each other instead of realizing they have shared enemies in the shape of an exploitative market, opportunistic leaders, and a militaristic culture. Sadly, I can attest to at least two great successes of this backlash, one which places Israel in a global context and one which is unique to Israel. The one which is shared by many countries is related to family law and divorce. Fathers groups in many first world countries have managed to successfully campaign for the abolishment of laws that recognize women's role as primary caregivers, although um, in most families they still are. Even more alarming is the relatively new trend of denouncing women for making supposedly folk accusa accusations regarding domestic violence and for alienating fathers from their children. In Israel, the field of family law has changed dramatically, although the law is in the book has not been changed. Fathers' groups have endeavored to generate false moral panic based on the narrative in which men are being torn away from their children and destined to poverty post-divorce. The hard statistics reveal this narrative to be entirely fictitious. As my study demonstrates, they use fake news in relation to suicide rates among divorced fathers. They use legal terrorism in the form of multi-million dollar suits in the US against Israeli judges and social workers dealing with the complex divorce cases in which children are involved. And they use online harassment, threats, and virtual shaming against judges, social workers, mediators, parliament members, and academics with whom they disagree. I wholeheartedly believe that there can and should be a lively debate over the legal questions of child custody and child support payment, but we cannot allow lies, threats, and the misuse of the law as legitimate features of the public discourse. Regrettably, social workers and judges are too easily impressed, influenced, or scared by the father's group's rhetoric. 
I hold that as a direct result of this crossing of boundaries, Israeli mothers wishing to divorce or currently navigating the process are in a much weaker position today than 10 years ago. In fact, I argue for the death of motherhood within Israeli law. Even though, as we saw, Israeli women still mother in ways that men do not and pay a high price for it in the public sphere, the law no longer protects them and it ignores their de facto demanding maternal role and its sacrifices. We see these changes not only in family law, but also in labor law that no longer protects women, pregnant women who are being fired, and in welfare law that no longer protects single mothers from poverty. The other successful strand of the anti-feminist backlash that, can, that I would like to highlight here, this time unique to Israel, is the alarming new phenomena of physical segregation between men and women and women's exclusion from the public sphere, which affects not only religious and ultra-religious communities, but the country at large. This phenomena is especially alarming in relation to the army and institutions of higher education. I'm so very proud that TAU is at the forefront of the battle against gender-based segregation in higher education and has recently decided not to allow any segregated events, including those initiated by outside organizations renting halls on campus. But feminists worldwide are not sitting idle in the face of ongoing old discriminations and new forms of harm done to women because they are women. We are all aware of the almost overwhelming example of the Me Too campaign. Thousands of women all over the world found the strain to speak up and reveal the sexual harassment or assault they had suffered from. I say overwhelming because it forced us all to realize how terribly common it is, suffered by almost all women at some point of their lives everywhere. Interestingly, the Israeli Me Too movement was born before the North American one. As early as 2013, an NGO called One Out of One launched a Facebook page inviting women to tell the stories of the sexual violence they had experienced. More than 2,000 testimonies were published, marking a new era in the struggle against sexual violence in Israel. No less inspiring is the new emergence of interest in gender studies and feminism from mainstream entities. As someone active in the academic realm, as well as the activist feminist movement for a quarter of a century, I can testify that never has, been, has my contribution been so popular and demanded. Schools, municipalities, governmental offices, high-tech companies all want to hear about women's status in Israel, ways to empower women, and how to create a roadmap to fulfill the vision of an egalitarian society. Just like in classic dialectics, it seems that the backlash had made many realize that indeed no feminist achievement should be taken for granted, and that all those who care about democracy and equal rights for all must work together against forces that seek to, seek to send us back to darker days. However, at the same time, many so-called liberals seem indifferent to the ongoing and new discriminations against women, and in, even cooperate with religious and conservative forces in the name of alleged pluralism and multiculturalism. Looking to the future, we are facing a huge challenge when it comes to addressing current women's need, needs while striving for a world in, in which a woman and a man are no longer important social categories. In recent years, I have students in my class who refuse to perform according to one of these two categories, choosing, for example, to combine a beard with big earrings and makeup. These students mark with their body the exciting option of an ungender world in which, we live, in which we will be able to shape our personal, familial, professional, and political biographies detached from the specific genitalia we were born with. Notwithstanding, until this vision materializes and for it to become a reality, we must face the current gender society in which we live with its categories, hierarchies, and power relations. I believe the most urgent tasks are, first, integrating gender studies and feminism into ed the educational curriculum from kindergarten to the 12th grade. The fact that most of my students learn about the most important social movement of the 20th century only when they start their BA studies is outrageous. Gender equality should be a basic and fundamental subject from a very early age. Second, democracy as a moral system should be protected. Misogyny, racism, and nationalism, as well as relativism, nihilism, and extreme postmodernism and multiculturalism should be answered by the insist insistence on human rights for all, the separation of state and religion, and independent judiciary, academia, and culture. Third, gender studies and feminist activism should study and address boys and men, 
Understanding masculinities and encouraging feminism for and with men is crucial for the future success of the gender equality vision. We cannot get there with only half of the population on board. <coughs> and of course, we must push for these three new terrains without neglecting the basic, ongoing, and still urgent feminist struggle for equal opportunities in the public sphere for girls and women, for the safety and independence in their homes, and for the individual, familial, and social prosperity. There are many kinds of feminism, and anyone who has taken part in a discussion among feminists knows there are as many opinions in the room as there are people. But our inter internal disagreements pale in the face of the current external anti-feminist threats. We must join forces together with all those who fear for the future of the liberal project and fight for gender equality and all other human rights for our sake, for the sake of our children, and for future generations. In choosing gender equality as the theme for the present category, the Dan David Foundation has marked its commitment and contribution to a feminist vision for all, girls and boys, women and men, LGBTIQ people, and society as a whole. We certainly need such philanthropic leadership if we are to succeed in our battle. I thank the Dan David family and foundation, and I congratulate the laureates and wait to hear their feminist visions when they come to Tel Aviv in May. I also congratulate the PhDs and postdoc students who will be able to pursue their research on gender equality thanks to the generous scholarships they are about to receive. Their dedicated work is a link in the long chain of feminist scholarship and in some aspects more important and urgent today than ever before. Thank you. Now please welcome Professor Lior Wolf of the School of Computer Science in the Faculty of Exact Sciences at Tel Aviv University, whose lecture is titled, The Next Step in AI Learning, Learning to Learn. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So, um, a question that I get to ask a lot in the, in the recent year is whether AI, artificial intelligence, whether it's slowing down or actually accelerating. And you can look at all the marvelous work that Demis and Amnon has been doing, not just really amazing discoveries in artificial intelligence, but also harnessing artificial intelligence for the benefit of mankind. And it's pretty amazing. And then there's the question, is there more coming? And I believe that there is a lot more coming. I believe that we are um, on the verge of something that is akin to what happened in biology 500 million years ago, when evolution just became faster and faster. This is called the Cambrian explosion. I think that AI, very similarly, is going to become much more prom prominent in our lives in the near future. And the reason that I believe so is because I see new technologies emerging all the time, and I see that the things that we are able to do right now is much um, more accurate, much more powerful than what we were able to do before. And I will give you some examples from uh, what we have been doing at Tel Aviv University, but more generally, this is what is happening across the field. This is what's happening in the work of Amnon. This is what's happening in the work of uh, Demis. And the world is changing as we speak. So let me begin our journey. In uh, 2015, I was uh, about to get promoted at Tel Aviv University. And the head of uh, our school, the School of Computer Science, uh, had a problem. So I was very highly motivated to solve this problem for him. The problem was that he was riding his bike to school every day and he was getting wet from time to time due to the rain. So he wanted to know whether uh, when he's going to fall on his way to school, and this is easy, you just need to predict the future. The problem is that rain, rain clouds have irregular shapes and they tend to, ma to move in unpredictable ways. So we had to develop technology to achieve this, and the technology that we had in, at that time, using convolutional neural networks, didn't work that well. So the prediction that we got was uh, not powerful enough 
in order to predict the weather. And if you look at the conventional neural network, then the structure is like this. You have the image, and then you have some weights that determine some activations of some neurons, and then some weights that determine more activations. What we started back then is what we call dynamic neural networks. So in dynamic neural networks, the weights that you see here are actually a function of the input. So they change from one example to the next. And as a result, you get a tool that is slightly more powerful and able to solve more problems. And you see a pronounced improvement, a drop in the error rate that you get. And this was 2015. We were able to help uh, people uh, remain dry. Um, and we forgot about this technology for a few years. And then something happened. Many different other groups discovered the same technology. So just like in uh, biology, there's the phenomena that is called convergence, in which dinosaurs can fly, and bats can fly, and birds can fly, and each one discovered flying by itself. Similar things happen in AI all the time, because it's a very active field. So the same idea of dynamic convolutions was rediscovered under the name hypernetworks in 2017, and then we discovered again in 2019 as dynamic convolutions and so on. We came back to work on this topic last year when we wanted to solve the problem of 3D reconstruction from a single image. So the input is a single image, the output is a 3D model. This is the task that we had in mind, what we wanted to solve. So you may ask, how is this even related to hyper, hyper networks? So hyper networks or dynamic convolutions, you have one network that learns another. So the way that this is related to 3D reconstruction is that if you think about a shape in 3D, you can think of, about it not just as a, as a static thing, you can think about it as a function. Basically, every point in 3D is a, can be mapped into inside the shape or outside of the shape. So what we did is to represent every shape as a function, as a neural network, and have another neural network that, given an input image, outputs the shape. The shape is now a neural network by itself. So one neural network learns another neural network. And this works brilliantly. We were able to get results that are much better than the state of the art. This is an active domain. And in this active domain, we were able to get better results with fewer resources and get very accurate video reconstruction. And the method is also very flexible because the idea that you use one function to learn another is something that is easy to implement and you can apply it in many different ways. So we were looking for collaborations. And the first collaboration came from a place that is totally unexpected. We started to collaborate with the Department of Zoology. So we collaborated with Professor Yossi Yovel from the Department of Zoology who studies bats. So as humans, it's very easy for us to understand vision and how we see things in the world. Much harder to understand how uh, sonars work and how bats perceive the world. So, sorry, moving from one computer to the next, the presentation is a bit distorted. But you get the idea, there's a bat over there and we want to understand how it sees. Since hyper networks are so general, we're, it's very easy to design a system where the input can be either sonar or can be an image, and then we can reconstruct based on either sonar or based on, on a, an image and compare the two. So this uh, project, which we called them uh, Superman versus Batman, actually we were able to get very nice discoveries that nobody had ideas before. For example, that computer vision vision is highly uh, correlated with sonar perception and a few differences, there are a few differences, but they are not that uh, significant. So this was about collaboration with the zoology department. I would like to talk a little bit about other collaborations and focus on collaborations until the end of the talk. And the next one is about electrical engineering. So what does an engineer do? So an engineer takes a specification and then comes back with a design. So the question is, how can a computer do the same thing? How can we have a robot engineer? So let's think a little bit about electrical circuits. 
So you can think about an electrical circuit as a sequence. So there is the, the power supply, and then you put a capacitator, and then you put, you put a resistor and other elements until you get the output of this electrical circuit. And we would like to give computers the power to design such circuits. So going from the circuit to the output current, it's very simple. You just do a simulation with very simple equations that are over there on the right. But in general, it's not very difficult. It's very simple. The problem is, is the design problem. How to get from the specifications, the current and the voltage that you want to get from the circuit, how to get from this specification back to the circuit, how to design the circuit, how to come up with a plan. So we again use a hyper network. So we give the specifications to a very deep neural network. And the neural network, what it does is that it gets the weights of another neural network. And the second neural network is the one responsible to putting the elements of the electrical circuit one by one until the entire circuit is complete. So this is what we did, and we got a breakthrough in the performance of such design uh, capabilities. So if you look at the literature, people really didn't know what to do, so they tried to use genetic algorithms, it didn't work. If you try to use conventional neural networks without hypernetworks, it doesn't work. If you try to use hypernetworks, you can design very complex electric, electrical circuits. And these type of design problems, I think this is what we're going to see in, in AI in the next uh, coming years. Let me show you another example. This example is a collaboration with Professor Chaim Sochowski from, um, from the School of Physics. And this work ab about nanophotonics. So nanophotonics is a way to get marvelous colors based on tiny particles. So this has been used by nature for ages and has been used by humans for 500 years, but without understanding the underlying phenomena. What happens here is that, we are, that now that there is a much better understanding of the phenomena, and we know that what happens is that the nanoparticles in this med medium over here too tiny to see even with a conventional microscope. You need an electrical microscope to see them. They absorbed some of the colors. And what's left out is the filter color. And by changing the shape of the nanoparticle, you're actually able to, to change the spectrum that you get. <coughs> so here again, it's a design problem. It's not as easy as before, but it's relatively well known how to go from the shape to the spectrum. But designing how to get from the spectrum back to the shape, this is something that uh, is almost always infeasible. And what we did is to make it feasible using deep learning for more and more complex shapes. So let me talk a little bit about other applications in which we used hyper networks. One of them, again, in electrical engineering, you think about communications, all the revolution that is going on with the 5G, you need to transmit without errors. This is being done with what is called error correcting codes. And once you transmit, you need to decode. What we do in our case, we take the decoder and we modify it such that we are using hyper networks inside the decoder. And this is work with Elian Nachmani. We were able to obtain state-of-the-art results in decoding polar codes, which are the the codes that are being used for 5G. The exact same technology can be used in chemistry and in bioinformatics in order to predict the properties of molecules. I'm not going to get into the details, but we are using graph convolutional neural networks combined with hyper networks, and we are able to obtain state-of-the-art results in all benchmarks in this uh, field as well. Let me finish with one last example. This one is an example in medicine. So this is a collaboration with Talma Hendler from the School of Medicine. In this work, she puts people under an fMRI performing a neurofeedback task. And she wants to predict whether they are going to be successful in this task or not. So not only that we are able to predict the level of success, we're able to also use the underlying representation, personal representation, in order to accurately predict psychiatric, psychiatric traits.
for these uh, persons. So for example, if somebody suffers a trauma, for example, from a car accident, we would like to predict whether they are going to develop PTSD syndromes in three months. And as you can see here, this fMRI-based system combined with AI is able to predict much better than questionnaires and clinical data the outcome that we are going to observe. So let me finish here. Tel Aviv University is really marvelous in the ability to combine different uh, knowledge domains under the same roof. And inter interdisciplinary research is a huge part of what is going, and I believe that AI is going to play an important part. We started talking about weather and environmental studies, and then moved to zoology, moved to electrical engineering, physics, electrical engineering again, this time in communication. We talked a little bit about chemistry and about medicine, but it's, also, it's only a handful of examples of what is possible to do in such collaborations. We also have other projects in astronomy, life sciences, archaeology, humanities, and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wolf. I'd like to also to add uh, political science into the, into the mix. I was intrigued by the first example you, you used about trying to predict clouds for your, uh, for your professor at the time. Um, I think more than 30 years ago, uh, one of the best known political scientists in America, Gabriel Armand, wrote uh, an essay in which he essentially recanted. He said, I was one of those who thought that political science was a science with laws and rules and obviously the ability to, to predict. And I must say now, 30 years later, that we were wrong. And he said, I would like to use the example of clouds and clocks. And in the sciences, it's like clouds. If it's 12 uh, uh, noon now, we know that 12 hours from now is going to be midnight. In human behavior, such as politics, it's like clouds. You never know. So you are now ruined it, <laughs> and uh, uh, which goes to show how life and disciplines and the university are changing dramatically uh, over the decades. So thank you so much for, for this, the two of you, for these illuminating presentations. Uh, this brings our uh, work tonight to, to an end, and we are all looking forward to seeing you in May. Good evening. <laughs>